In our globalized world, millions of tons of cargo are moved each day. This kind of huge-scale trade sounds like a modern idea, but people living 4,000 years ago would easily have recognized this concept. Today, we'll take a close look at the oldest businessman we have a trace of. This is the story of the Asivan trading system. My name is Sarah. Welcome to the Mists of Time. Our story begins in the city of Ashur, in the land of Mesopotamia. We are outside a richly decorated house. The landlord was a man named Ashura Kidina. He was an Assyrian coming from a wealthy family of merchants. Ashura Kidina was checking his donkeys, making the final arrangements as it was just about time to depart. In fact, many inhabitants of Ashur regularly made fortunes by way of long-range trade. The journey will take Ashura Kidina and his brothers from their native city of Ashur to Kanesh in Anatolia, nowadays known as a part of modern-day Turkey. They expect to get quite rich off of this trading expedition. But the road ahead is long and hard. It will take about 40 days of travel through rough and dangerous lands, roaming the arid pastures of northern Mesopotamia, crossing rivers, hiking over mountains, and going through dark forests before reaching their final destination. The Assyrians will move about 30 kilometers per day, and occasionally they will find a safe haven. Along the road, there were special inns for traveling merchants like them, or they'd come across villages that contained safe houses. But sometimes they had to sleep rough. Ashura Kidina was the youngest of his family. This was his first expedition, and he raced alone through his father. The amount of money needed for an expedition like this one was quite substantial, and it was impossible for a single merchant to do it alone. So joint ventures were quite normal. In Ashura Kidina's case, he had put some money together with his brothers. Amurili crossed the main gate. He was Ashura Kidina's eldest brother and his servants were carrying some luxury textiles. These textiles were bought in Sumer, the land south of Ashur. The margin on these items was very high, and they were much prized by the nobility of Anatolia. Finally, Ashurimiti, the last brother, arrived. His servants were carrying bulky baskets. They were full of tin, a shiny silvery metal. This was a strategic resource at the time. In fact, when you mix molten copper and tin, you create bronze, an alloy that's harder than copper alone and can be used to make very effective weapons and tools. Ashurimiti's tin consignment was extracted and refined into East, in what's now known as Iran. Tin and copper were used to produce bronze, but mines of the requisite metals were not generally found in the same region. So, traders like Ashrimiti were essential to the production of this revolutionary alloy. The city of Ashur was clearly in a very strategic position, in the middle of two important productive regions, and so naturally a hot spot of opportunities. But a strategic position is also sometimes a liability. Ashur's council of merchants regulated trade strictly, working to advance the geopolitical needs of the Assyrian city-state. The textiles had a very high margin of profit compared to the tin, but the council forced the merchants to always make tin a third of the total consignment. In this way, the powerful tin-producing neighbors of the East could be kept happy and satisfied with a market for their products. The southern cities could be dangerous too. At one point, the council forced the merchants to stop selling an Anatolian textiles that was quite competitive in Mesopotamia. The disruption of the textile market could make the southern neighbors quite angry, and no one wanted to displease them. So the Assyrians bet their safety would be ensured not by powerful armies, but by becoming indispensable to the regional trade system. A very modern concept indeed. 
When the three brothers were about to leave, their old father showed up, giving them some letters to carry to Kanesh. The Assyrian merchant class had a very high literacy rate. Even women could read and write, quite an unusual thing in this era. The merchant class provided the continual movement of letters concerning loans and debts between Ashur and Kanesh. Much of what we know from this era is thanks to these written messages. These letters were really something else. The extreme interest rates, and by that I mean 30 to 108% interest rates. And not just that, but the faulting on your debts meant you had to sell yourself or your relatives into servitude. Gross profits could be around 200% on the trade goods, but high interest rates, taxes, tolls and the dangers of the road meant you could either wind up extremely rich or extremely poor. Before the departure of the three brothers, officials from the city hall inspected the animals to check if the bags were sealed and whether export taxes had been correctly paid. The senior official nodded, and Ashur Akidina, Ashurimiti and Amurili finally set off, leaving Ashur behind. The merchants had six donkeys, making this quite a substantial expedition. Each animal carried two saddlebags containing about 30 kilograms of cargo each. These bags were sealed and they could not be opened along the journey. But each donkey carried a small top bag with some tin used for the journey expenses, as money had not been invented yet. In total, each animal had 70 kilograms on its back. Tin and textiles were the main traded goods, but sometimes merchants took with them scrap bronze, nails, lamp oil and gemstones. For 10 days, the merchants followed the Tigris River. Then they traveled west by crossing the arid plains of northern Mesopotamia. They used well-known paths, stopping at inns and friendly villages. Eventually, they reached the city of Ahum, where they had to cross a river. A treaty had been signed many years prior. In exchange for a fee, the king of Ahum had to let boats cross the river. He also had to compensate the merchants for any losses from brigands' attacks or during the river crossing. The treaty also stated that if no caravan had come in a whole year, that the king would be paid two kilograms of tea. In other words, quite the profitable treaty. The king of Ahum imposed import tariffs too, but his main privilege was the right to buy trade goods at a hugely discounted rate. Ahum was a major hub for merchants, and the three brothers rested here for some days at one of Ashurimiti's houses. Wealthy merchants owned many houses in the places where they had commercial interests, and they used them as bases for their businesses. From Ahum, the merchants could continue to travel to the west, reaching the wealthy cities on the Mediterranean Sea but they never did it. The reason why they avoided modern-day Syria is quite a mystery. An explanation has been proposed, but it's based on what's essentially a hunch, not documentation. So, to take it with a pinch of salt. As we have seen, the saddlebags were sealed before leaving Ashur and could not be opened before reaching Hahum. It's quite likely that the Assyrians could not legally make any major trade in this area. And in fact, there were three rival trading cities in the south, Ebla, Emar and Mari. They probably cut the region into spheres of influence with some kind of agreement. This hypothesis may be confirmed by a treaty which stated that any non-Assyrian merchants that worked in Anatolia had to be punished with death. Maybe one day new documents will explain this mystery, but for now we have no concrete explanation. Finally, everything was ready for the most dangerous part of the journey, crossing the mountains. Just before their departure from Hahum, Amurili sacrificed the goat to the gods, chanting a magical spell. In his own words, Blood, O oh bloody! 
The black dog lurks on a mound, waiting for the scattered caravan, looking out for a good man. Many dangers awaited them, as moving in such an isolated area with very valuable cargo could attract armed robbers. Also, wars could make road impracticable. In fact, during any war, disrupting the flow of valuable resources was very important, making the merchant a prime target. But hoping for the blessing of the gods wasn't the only protection the merchants relied on. Local kings sent armed patrols along the roads, hoping to deter any troublemakers. And the merchants were always happy to pay a small fee to the patrolmen to ensure their loyalty. Traveling among narrow valleys and crossing mountain passes took many days. The three brothers had to sleep without any shelter, spending long and cold nights, guarding the donkeys and the cargo against robbers or wild animals. But eventually, they reached the Anatolian Plateau. Compared to their native Mesopotamia, it must have been like an alien world, due to its tall snowy mountains, rolling hills and dark forests. The region was divided into many different kingdoms. And near each major town, the Assyrians built a Karum, meaning a trading colony. It was a sort of small village where the merchants and their families lived. These colonies had residential areas, warehouses, and offices to manage all the bureaucracy that the trading system generated. After almost 40 days on the road, the three brothers arrived at Kanesh, which was the main trading colony of the region. In Kanesh, Amorili had the largest state. Every time merchants arrived in a city, they had to pay import tariffs to the king's official. But in some cases, ruthless merchants were more than ready for tax evasion. We have a letter detailing how tax evasion was carried out. Tin was smuggled into the market by hiding it in their underwear but the three brothers were law-abiding merchants, as smuggling and tax evasion could result in a harsh jail sentence. In terms of taxes, about 2 kilograms of tin and 5% of the textile had to be generally paid. On top of this, the king of Kanesh had the right to buy 10% of the textile at a discount rate. It seems that the kings insisted on the right to buy the textiles. These luxury items were then gifted to the noblemen to buy their loyalty. In turn, they would use fashionable foreign textiles to show off their status. In some ways, it was the modern equivalent of buying fancy tailored suits. Ashura Kidina was the youngest of the three, and he was eager to prove himself. His eldest brothers sold their share of goods in Kanesh, but after some days of rest, Ashura Kidina said his goodbyes to his brothers, took his two donkeys and started roaming the whole Anatolian region. For weeks, Ashura Kidina moved, city by city. He rested at small inns where he heard rumors about distant wars from the locals. He met fellow merchants and exchanged their opinions about commercial opportunities. He traded his wares with kings and noblemen but didn't expect what was going to happen to him. One day, he was having a business meeting with the king of a remote city in the west. The king said he had something very rare to trade. A servant bought a wicker basket covered by some cloth. Inside the basket, there was a strange stone. It was some amotto, the most prized commodity one could find. It was a meteor from space, made of solid iron. For Ashura Kirina, it was the biggest opportunity of his life. In the Bronze Age, no one knew how to smelt iron, so meteors provided the only available source of this material. His brothers had been quite lucky in their previous trades, but Ashura Kirina was soon going to be one of Ashur's wealthiest merchants. <laughs> 